Thank you. <clears throat> so interestingly enough, tonight I'm going to try and make 10 predictions because you all came for the stock picks. Um, so a little bit about the, the brief. Buying when the market is at all-time highs. I mean, the, it's scary to get involved in the equity markets at the moment because they are pretty high. Whether in the U.S., as Simon said, whether the U.S. And by the way, the Zim market is at all-time highs as well. The Nikkei is right, not at all-time highs. It's back to the level that I bought at in 1994. When I put some of my pension fund money into the Nikkei, it's finally got back to that level. So I'm feeling like I got some money back at, at last. Um, so I'm going to jump straight in. Um, for those of you who like technology, every stock pick uh, that I'm going to show you tonight is actually available online in real time with my trading desk. So we run a little piece of technology called Telegram. It's not ours. It's uh, publicly available. It's a free piece of software. If you note down that URL, type that in, go to Telegram, and you'll see all of these stock picks. And, and, and also what you'll have is interaction with my trading desk and my analysts and my portfolio managers, and you can ask them questions. So every one of these stock picks you'll see, I've taken a screenshot from Telegram and to show you that it's real, we do put these things out in real time. Um, and that's kind of what Telegram looks like. It's a chat environment, and you can ask us questions. You can see LD is Lester, uh, who's one of our uh, technical analysts. So why are we here? And uh, sorry, Bloomberg. Bloomberg is always a, a black background, so it doesn't make for great pictures. But that's a Bloomberg uh, screenshot of the all share. Is that the all share or the? No, I think that's the top 40. But what essentially, from 2007, 2008, when we had that scary sell-off, it's sort of almost been a one-way trip. And um, we've been talking about the end of this bull market for probably, I suppose, since about there. So it's about three or four years. Everyone's been saying, when's this going to end? When's this going to end? And we've been going roughly sideways for the last year and a half. But you can see that trend is still very much intact. And the other thing is that it's becoming very expensive because that's price earnings multiple of the market. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that just now. So this is compliments of ABSA. The one good thing about being on a stockbroking desk, you get great research from all the banks and, and a lot of the asset managers. So never be shy to ask your stockbroker, you know, what he's getting, what research he's getting in, what he thinks, because he should be sitting on sort of uh, information and research like this. So this is from ABSA uh, stockbrokers, uh, ABSA Asset Management. And you'll see at the time when they put this out, which was about a month ago, they were saying that the, that the PE of the overall market is at 19 times, which puts it quite expensive. Not as, as expensive as it could be, but quite expensive. And they were saying based on that, that there can only be two things that can happen against the average of 12 and a half uh, from a historical PE point of view. Either the share prices have to come down or earnings have got to come through. To, I mean, that's, it's a price earnings multiple. Only two things can happen. Price come down or earnings go up. Well, I don't think earnings are really going to go up that much. So that means that sometime, and it might be, unfortunately it wasn't today before the presentation, prices are going to come down. And I think we all will get a sell-off, and it will be sometime in the not-too-distant future. So I think one of the, the things I would like you to take away from this presentation when I get to it just now is that beware of a sell-off because one's going to come. and it doesn't want to move on. So there will be. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen this cartoon where it starts as a buy, ends up as a sell, and markets move in cycles. So we will get a, a sell-off, and then it's a good time to get, get involved again on the buy side. It's not just us. So this is the MSCI All uh, World Index, and you'll see, I mean, it's becoming quite expensive. That's all the markets in the world in one index. And you can see that is two standard deviations. So we are kind of expensive. So, once again, another little, little joke, the snow is falling, sell snow, sell snow, sell, sell, sell. I think my, what I don't want you to take away from this presentation tonight is that the market is going to crash. Um, I think there are opportunities in the market, and I want to take you through a few of them. Here's some that were here this year. So, these are the, the, the strongest exchange-traded funds in the whole world this year. And interestingly enough, Bitcoin is right at the top. And I, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't get phone calls about Bitcoin, and I'm happy to chat about it afterwards, but I don't think that's the brief of this presentation. The other one that's done pretty well is Exchange Traded Fund on being short in volatility or risk in the U.S. So you can see that there is huge amounts of alpha out there. You've just got to look for it. I mean, the top one there is 
year to date. That's an exchange traded product and that's done 300%. So don't be scared to look for alpha out there. There are always places you can make money in a market. What must I point this at that it becomes a bit more responsive? Okay, so the this is the sort of stuff that you're probably coming across and it comes across our, our, our desk. You know, Dave Stockman says, get out of the casino, leave, get out of the market. It's going to go 40 to 70% down. Maybe he's right. JP Morgan, one of their strategists says, have no fear. Markets are going to keep going higher. I mean, these are comments that have been made in the last couple of days and just shows you how bi a bipolar this market is at the moment. Wells Fargo sees trouble for stocks, brace for a small slide before the end of the year, 4 to 8%. And CNBC's latest poll expects market to decline slightly into the year end. So you kind of got people telling you it's going up, some people telling you it's going to crash. So what happens if we do get a crash? So let me go back to that one. Markets crash. It happens. It happens every five to seven years. They crash. They go down quite dramatically. They normally go down between 30 40%, sometimes more. It normally lasts between... Nine months to 12 months, that sell-off, and then we come out the other side. Then we have a wonderful bull market, which normally takes about five to seven years. So we will get one of these in the next, within the next year, we should get one. It's natural. Um, so watch out for them. Maybe make some money on the short side, but that's not my brief tonight because I can teach you how to make money in a falling market. But what I'm saying to you is that there is a crash like this that's due. So be nimble, be quick, stay defensive. Be careful. Don't expose all your money to these markets at the moment because you are going to get one of these and you are going to get one of them shortly. There is a school of thought that out there, and this is, do yourself a favor. Go onto a website called Stock Twits. They do wonderful tweets. And they have a great community of people who are quite educated and are quite outspoken. And I love this guy because he's saying, I'm going to have to tell my kids in 10 years from now that the market never goes down. And this was only posted a couple of weeks ago, and he's right. The US market at the moment just doesn't want to go down. It just keeps going. So that's the problem with being one of these naysayers who say the market is going to crash and sitting on the sideline. You might end up sitting on the sideline for a long time. This is uh, Anthony to uh, Andrew Todd, Traders Corner. Uh, some of you may have watched Traders Corner on a Monday night. And this slide he put out this morning, and, and I completely agree with Andrew. This market is going up, and every time it sells off a little bit, the bulls just have it. So you can keep going, yeah, I'm going short, I'm going short. But this is the last four days. Now, we've had a client who sat uh, short of the Aussie for the whole week so far this week and has been creamed with this movement up. So you can try preempt the sell-off, but you're probably going to be wrong. So I wouldn't bother. Okay, so that's enough of telling you about crashes, etc. Let's tell you how you can hopefully make some money in a market that's going to either go up, go sideways, or go down in the next, the next couple of months. So this is the overall market. We break the market up into three, three blocks. Resources, financial, and industrial. And you can go down to subsectors, but those are the three main um, sort of economic components. So if this is the overall market, this is industrials, mostly the driving force of the market. This is financials. You can see what I've done is this is a three-year chart. So you can see over three years, financials have gone nowhere. Resources, yes, we had that wonderful little blip up. You might remember a year and a half, two years ago, and everyone got excited about resources. But since then, we've pretty much gone sideways. So we are down substantially over a three-year period on resources. And industrials have been the, the main driver of our market. And we'll unpack that a little bit more in a minute. But what you can see here is that although the market looks expensive, the whole market doesn't look expensive. You've got to drill into it and take out the expensive bits potentially out of your portfolio. So you can see that financials, and probably for good reason, don't look expensive, and a lot of resource stocks don't look expensive. But resources stocks come with their own problems. So let's unpack that top 40 a little bit more. And this is this year, and I must thank Drian uh, Janssen, our portfolio manager, these are just indicative points, moves. You know, so he's worked, he's got a model here where he explains what the top 40 is doing based on its underlying constituents. And you'll see that the top 40, which is a, and I'm in the JSC, so I've got to be careful what I say here. The top 40 is a poor index. And the reason the top 40 is a poor index is two stocks, or well, mainly one stock being NASPAS, is pretty much 20 odd percent of the index. 
So it's not a very diversified, broad-based index anymore. So the index is up about 15, almost 16% for the year. But if you equal weighted all of the shares in the index, it's actually only up 4, almost 5%. And the reason the index is up so much is because NASPERS is up 50% for the year. And NASPERS's contribution to that 15% move is 10%. So effectively, if you bought NASPERS or you bought the index, you pretty much would have got, okay, you would have underperformed by 4 or 5% if you just bought NASPERS. Now, that's not a clever move to just put one stock in your portfolio, but essentially when you're buying the top 40, that's effectively what you're doing for a huge portion of it. The other mover is Richmond. Richmond gave you the rest. Now, if you thought the market was expensive and everything was moving up, you'd expect this page to be full of green, and it isn't. Most of it is flat, and some of it is red. So Richmond is up 3.5%. Nasdaq is up 10 and that's of an overall 15%. So the rest of the page, every other stock that you, that you know and that you buy, is actually contributing less than 1% of the index. And we think that's a problem, because we think that these have probably run too hard, and that you've probably got to go and look at the other stocks for your opportunity set going forward from here. Because really, how much more can NASPAS give you? You can't not have NASPAS, but it's kind of probably a little bit stretched at this level. So let's go and have a look at, this is put out every quarter. Uh, it's done by Sunlam. Um, it's called the Bull and Bear Forecasts. They use seven of the large asset managers uh, to put this research together. And this is always them looking at 12 months. And I think this is a very good gauge of what the big asset managers are expecting uh, for the next 12 months in the market. And I want to concentrate on the, on the equity component there, here because that's what we had to talk about, the stock market. So you'll see four out of seven managers think that the market can be up 8%, uh, over 8% now, looking forward for the next 12 months. Now, this, is, this was put out, I think, about a month ago. So we've already got some of that uh, movement already built into that number. You can see one out of seven said 7%. Only one really bullish asset manager, uh, bearish asset manager saying below 5%. Now, remember, we can get to 8% by going down 40% first and then going back up 50 I mean, that is a possibility. So they're just saying point to point. But you can see generally most of the asset managers, and remember, these are the guys that put money in the market every month through pension, provident funds, retirement annuities, voluntary money, etc., will still be putting money into this equity market because they're expecting at least an 8% growth. Now, 8% growth is not, very, is not very high. Your equities over a long period of time, 20, 25 years, should give you around about 15% growth. So they're effectively saying the engine house is a little bit broken. We'll probably do half of what you should do uh, in a normal year. But I still think that's comforting that anybody who's getting involved in this market, there's still some life left in this market. Then if you break it down into where they're looking for, to get their, their sort of returns from, you know, if you look here, sort of 10, 15%, you can see resources and financials. And if you go back to that slide of earlier, if you remember, we were saying industrials have probably done enough. And you can see all the asset managers think that way, that industrials is probably not where you want to be hunting uh, for your alpha at the moment. You probably want to be concentrating on the resources and financials. Um, mid caps, three out of seven managers think that mid caps uh, will give you some value. And I've got, a, I've got some mid-cap stocks that we're going to look at. And they're still saying that value is probably a, a, a place to look. So I think now let's – that was to set the scene of where I think the market is at the moment, where I think that the, the whole market, the, the three sectors, resources, financials, and industrials, where they're, at, where they're positioned at the moment. So I want to now go into some of the trading ideas that we look at and you'll see what I've done here is every one of them is a screenshot of our chat environment. Uh, and we, this is what you would see if you go into the chat. And then you can click on it and have a look at the chart. So first one I'm going to talk about, Anheuser-Busch. You know, large brewing company. You can have access to it via the, the IDX instrument on the, on the JSE. Um, so if we have a look at that chart, this is very technical, this pattern. Our technical analyst believes that that sort of flat-topped triangle He's looking for a break out here with a, with a target, target price of 18, 18.30 on this. So very, very technical pattern. So one, maybe we're not, you know, we don't think the brewing industry has got a huge amount uh, of life in it. We think volumes are going to be depressed. But technically, this looks like 
we could get a break higher and we could make two bucks on that. We would put it into the portfolio for that sort of move. Next one, little, little stock. So now going into the small, small cap, medium cap space, Omnia. Um, the urea price. So urea is urine, uh, but it's a fertilizer. It's an input for fertilizer. So the urea price has been pushing up massively, but Omnia's share price has not. Now, the two should have a direct relationship with each other. Similar to the fact that Sassel has, is really just oil and a dollar. Uh, those are your two main things you watch. Here, you would think that Urea and Omnia would have some sort of relationship. So we asked our analyst, well, this is Robbie P, actually, uh, one of my stockbrokers. He had a look at it, and he was, look, he was saying, look, this candle and this break here, after all of this, we're looking like this is going to go better. And we actually put this trade on this morning. So we are in this trade. So uh, we do eat our own cooking. Um, so we, we're in at, at slightly better than 147. We would have a target of this of 157. So a mid-cap stock, probably not really covered by the analysts, but which has an essential driver, which is the urea, ship, the urea price. Maybe put it on your radar. And these slides are available. That This is being recorded. So you can go and have a look at these and do your own analysis on these stocks tomorrow. Here's one that happened yesterday. This is what we think this market is. It's very skittish. So every bit of bad news is priced in and exceptionally quick. So I don't know if you saw Vodacom yesterday. This is Vodacom's share price yesterday. Bit of bad news comes out, 7%. Now, the sad thing about yesterday for us, we put out a buy on Vodacom. We thought it might come back. So this is the, the dilution. Uh, it just issued stock, diluted down, and it got punished a little bit for it, and you've got that gap there. We thought we might see it come back up here or come try fill the gap. So we actually got in yesterday, and then the bad news hit. And we almost got stopped out intraday on our trade. But what's interesting about this, this one, when I put the slide together, and I, this slide I actually did this morning because I thought this was very topical and we should put it in because maybe there's a short-term opportunity for you guys. I put this little sarcastic line at the, at the bottom saying, by the time you read this, it's probably over. Well, guess what? It was. Now, I don't know where it closed this afternoon, but my understanding is that by the time I left the office, we had almost recovered the entire yesterday's move today. And that's the problem with this market at the moment. It's exceptionally skittish, and it's moving around a lot on news. But that creates opportunities because that is probably was unjustified. It was probably overdone to be 7 or 8% down intraday. We have, a, we have a rule of thumb at the moment. If there's bad news, we typically don't buy it normally on the first day. We don't buy it on the second day. We call it our rule of three. We wait for the third day. Because by that time, a lot of the loose, the, 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 what would you call it, the weak hands have dumped their stock, and you can probably pick stuff up at a, at a good price. So unfortunately, I think this one's done. I think you can ignore that slide. But look for the next bit of bad news on, on, on a stock that overreacts like this. Next one, retailers. Now, the reason I put a retailer in, we don't like retailers at the moment. We think medium term to long term, we haven't got a huge exposure in our portfolios to retailers. We have a little bit of exposure. But what we don't like, and this is this chart here, is that, and I'm not a big technical analyst, but some things make sense to me. And there's a head and shoulders there, and I can bring my technical guy in, he can come and explain it to you. But retailers as a whole do not look great at the moment. But we think that within short periods of time, you are finding decent levels to accumulate some of these retailers and make some money out of them in the, in the short term. So if we have a look at this chart on pick and pay, you'll see there's almost a triple bottom here. And we are certainly accumulating pick and pay here and looking for it to maybe come back to this inclined support that it, it had. But we're not looking for much on this. We, we will lighten very quickly on these retailers if we're in the money. So I think you could... This chart is probably the same for every retailer. If you do the chart, they've all come back. They're all a bit depressed, and you probably could accumulate any of them and maybe look for a short-term bounce on them. So, I mean, you're talking about buying here at about 55, 56 and offloading it in the mid-60s. That would be our, our sort of thesis on, on the retailers at the moment. Uh, I could have put any retailer chart up on here. It was just our guys were accumulating. So these are real trades. These are trades that we're doing in our trading environment and we're promoting out to our clients. Um, another offshore stock, Johnson & Johnson. Now, you'll notice there's a trend coming out here. 
this is about, I think in this market, there's a lot of technical patterns, a lot of short-term trading opportunities, etc. So you'll see that a lot of what we're putting out at the moment is very short-term technical patterns. So this one is clearly, there's a sideways channel. Uh, and this is, this is indicative of the chat on the group. Lester puts out, offshore Johnson Johnson managing to stay within the range, sort of circa 129. Me, that's actually my face that I cut off there. Lester, would you buy the range? Hi, Mark. The share would see some resistance, 131.40. If we see a pullback to 129. So that's, you would have got that, that chat as well because we're all in the same chat group. Yes, I'd buy. So that is one that we have got in the portfolio at the moment for our offshore. And we, we are looking for it just to retrace back to the top of that channel. And then we're probably out because then we're sitting at a sort of triple top and we're probably done on that. This is one that we put out the other day. I'm sure everyone's heard of Anchor Group, Anchor Capital, fantastic business, great little asset manager, listed at three bucks, had a, stomp of a stomping of a listing. Thing went up. Can't remember where, where its high was. Well, we'll see now when we look at the chart. Fantastic listing, reached the top, did a second listing of Astoria. Have no idea why Astoria did so well because all it was was a bucket of offshore cash and you don't pay much for offshore cash. It traded at a premium to net asset value, which it shouldn't do. You can't buy cash at a premium. You, in fact, should short it. So both Astoria and Anchor looked expensive and they've both come back down. And we think they've come down to probably good levels. So technically, I think they would call that a tweezer formation. You know, it's getting in this really tight. And what that tells you is it's getting very compressed, that, that movement. And it's going to go one way or the other. But if you look at the next chart, listed at 3 bucks, went all the way up, 18 bucks. Obviously, someone out there thought it was worth 18 bucks. It certainly wasn't us. We did think it was worth something over here. But there it looked very expensive. And they were buying assets, and they were buying very expensive assets. So they bought Capricorn Asset Managers on a seven, I think, uh, multiple of, of assets under management. So very expensive up here. And they were accumulating assets, very expensive with their own paper. And, but they did some good deals. Bought good asset managers, set up a stockbroking desk, set up a multi-manager business. And the market has been punishing them, and they've come down and down and down. And maybe we're not going to get in back at the listing price of three bucks, but we think at four bucks. You're probably not a bad small asset manager um, to put into your portfolio for a recovery. And that recovery could be quite dramatic. You know, we're saying target price of six bucks fifty. Now, if you looked at the Signia share price, you'd probably see the same pattern. We also like Signia, but we'd like it a little bit cheaper than this. So certainly small asset managers um, have have had a tough time. Um, and probably worth looking at doing some research on and adding it to your portfolio because we do think, I mean, this is against a market that's been going up, so their assets have been increasing, they're earning more fees, and they've been sliding. Uh, I think they've been overly punished. So if you don't like Anchor, um, there are a couple of other smaller caps out there, and also there are quasi unit trusts that are listed. So long for life, you know, Came to the market, bucket of cash, you know, fantastic CEO, great track record, uh, did, did one or two deals. Every time you see a little spike here is when they announce a deal, and then it reprices. So don't buy it on the day that they announce a deal or the next day, because you can see there's this phenomenal run up. But we think, and this is Robbie's chart, we think that this thing is worth getting involved in. They're starting to accumulate some good underlying businesses. It's like having a listed unit trust. And it is, just doesn't seem to be able to get going. So you do get movements up. And we think sort of, I don't know what Rob's level on this is. It's probably just below six or around six. He's probably looking to accumulate long for life, put in a portfolio. And then you've got a couple of decent, uh, decent underlying stocks that you're holding via long for life. And also, you, you, can't, you can't beat Joffrey's track record. He's going to do something right sometime. Just hasn't been yet. Well, if you exclude that nonsense there. Uh, which was when they announced one of their deals. So another way of putting stuff into your portfolio at the moment is, is to look outside of equities. And I'm using palladium as an example here. Palladium, pal palladium and rhodium have both had phenomenal runs this year. Platinum has not. So the, I think the highest moving ETF this year on the JSC is the exchange-traded note on rhodium. 
It's probably up 38, 40% for the year. So you did well if you put that in your portfolio. But we think palladium is probably a, not a bad commodity to put into your portfolio. And you can do that via the exchange traded note. Uh, Standard Bank has a note on this. Um, so that's the palladium movement in the palladium price. You've had this pullback a little bit. You know, you've, all of those metals had a, had a push up, slight pullback. And this is, this is the palladium future, but you would, you would trade it. We would trade it directly normally in our portfolios. We would trade it offshore directly on the futures. Locally here, you'd trade it via the exchange traded notes, uh, and they hold commodities. Um, so there is palladium, there's rhodium, there's copper, silver, gold available in our market. There's also oil, um, and we used to have coal, but that's gone. Um, but you at least have got, and then on the soft side, you can add uh, corn, uh, corn and wheat, I think, on the soft side. So you can add quite a lot of commodities as a diversifier in your portfolio. And you can't argue with this. I mean, commodity prices have had a little bit of a charge. Um, and we do think that that, you can see that moving average there is still in place. Came down to test it. Looks like we could probably have a little bit more movement. So maybe add a little bit of palladium exchange traded note into your portfolio. That's something different. The other one everyone asked me about is gold. So we don't buy gold as an investment. We trade gold. And we think 1270, 1280, somewhere around here, it's probably worth looking at gold. You know, any bit of news, any bit of geopolitical risk that comes out of North Korea, this will have another move. So there's two ways to play risk. One is to go and play in the commodity space. The other one is to go and play the VIX. And I'm going to talk about the VIX just now. But we think that gold around about here, we're not, a, we're not an investor in gold, we're a trader in gold. We'll buy it and we'll look for it to push, I don't know, $50, $60. And, and we do get involved fairly short term in gold. I'm not a fan of GLD, but it is what it is. It's listed on our exchange. You can trade it. Problem with GLD is it's got a Rand dollar component in it. So I lose all the effect because the dollar and the gold price tend to be negatively correlated or inversely correlated. So everything I'm getting on my gold, I'm giving up normally on my Rand dollar. So that's why GLD for me is not the greatest way of playing this, but it is what we have and we, and we do trade it. Another small cap one that you might want to have a look at. And uh, I thought their share price should have got hammered after they sponsored the Springboks. But uh, blue, um, you know, Robbie likes blue at the moment. He's seeing an inverse head and shoulders here. I don't quite see it, but I'm not a technical, I'm not a technical analyst. So uh, I'm thinking, he, well, he's thinking 1650. He wants to start accumulating blue. He thinks that blue could push back, uh, back to its previous high, which is, which is up here. So 22, 23. He's looking for it to take out its previous high. Um, I haven't got a view on blue at all. It's not a stock I watch. Um, but you're more than welcome to message Robbie, ask him what his thoughts there on, on blue. But a, but a sort of mid-cap uh, stock to put into your portfolio. Then what we've started getting from clients is, um, I did a presentation about two weeks ago. I did a diversified portfolio. And um, the client said, that's very boring. Can't you put something more interesting in? So I've started doing once or twice a week what I call my moonshot trades. And these are mine. These are just my ideas. You know, when you wake up at 2 in the morning and you get a good idea, you need to write it down. And, and sometimes you get good trading ideas. So I call them my moonshot trades. And I do tend to trade derivatives or options on these. But I try to put out slightly different thoughts on these. So two weeks ago, $3,200 on Bitcoin. I liked it. We were going to buy, well, 3200 we were a buyer on Bitcoin. So we tend to kind of put esoteric, esoteric trading ideas into our moonshot trades. And this was one we put out. And, and quite frankly, it's not going well for us at the moment. It's the volatility index. It's the VIX. Now, you can trade the VIX uh, on our exchange. There is an exchange traded note it's under IDX which gives you access via an exchange traded note to the VIX in the US. Now, the VIX is just a measure of risk. So basically, it, the, the ETF that's, or the ETN that's traded on the local market here, that's, that's an IDX product, is the near-dated and the next contract, which measures the volatility on the Chicago. Now, I didn't say that very well. Come and speak to me afterwards. I'll take you through the maths on it. But if, effectively, when, when risk is below 10 in the US, it's cheap. 
That, that means that the U.S. market is not pricing in any event risk. So you'll see, this was, this was North Korea. Send a, send a rocket across the northern part of Japan, spike in volatility. We're going to, we're going to war. It all calmed down for a couple of days. Next test, he let off another, another nuclear test, another spike. And then suddenly, market's just kind of gone to sleep. So I was reckoning that about 10, 10.4, 10.3, the market was pricing in too little risk in the U.S. Today, it's nine and a half. So we're down here. So we're almost at all-time lows for volatility in the States. Now, you can't tell me that this market doesn't feel risky at the moment. So for me, this is one of my, and I promised I'd only show trades that are long. So this is a bit of a cheat because this is long volatility, but it's actually short the market because it means I expect a crash sometime. So I am accumulating volatility, the VIX. And this is my protection uh, against our portfolio in case it comes back. And I'm happy to talk about the VIX with anybody afterwards because I think the VIX is, a, is something that South Africans don't use enough, a sort of hedging mechanism against volatility. So those are my trades. I was hoping to cover, well, I hope I've covered a couple of big stocks, a couple of sectors, some commodities, some small and mid cap, and then a couple of trading ideas. And I just like to leave you with a couple of what I consider my parting thoughts. And then I'm, I'm opening, I'm open for questions. I'm happy to, if it's stock specific, I'm probably going to fob you off on one of my analysts or one of my tra traders. Or, um, but I'm happy to take any questions, whether you want to talk about FX, Bitcoins, anything I'm w willing to chat about. But my parting thoughts, and I keep saying this to my trading desk, trade what's in front of you. Stop trying to overanalyze this. Stop overthinking this. Yes, the market's expensive. We all know that. And you know, there are thousands of articles telling me that the market's expensive. That doesn't help me trade today. So trade what's in front of you. If Vodacom goes down 7 or 8% and it's being overpunished by the damn thing, don't worry that the market's expensive. That being said, stay nimble. If something's going against you, get the hell out. That's what a stop loss is for. So stay nimble in this market because I do think there is going to be a big sell-off just now and you don't want to be caught with all your chips on the table because you're going to get hurt. And you will drop 30, 40, 50%. So stay nimble in this market. So don't buy something you can't get out of. You know, I always used to say presentations many years ago and it wasn't appreciated that when I get onto a plane, I read that if you're within seven, seven rows of the door, you'll survive. Typically, people that get die in a plane crash or in a fire in a plane, it's rows after row seven from the door. So whenever you get into your seat, whether it's forward or backwards, make sure within seven seats of the door. Always when you go into a building, know where the fire exit is. In this market, know where the exit is. Because if you go and buy, put all of your money to small caps in this market and you can't get out when it crashes, then you're in for a long time. Then you might as well just pay up, hold it for four or five years, and, and wait to get out of the trough. Mix it up. I'm so tired of stockbrokers only sell equities. There's such a big asset mix out there. Also, go long, go short, add some pairs. You know, sometimes when you look at retailers, there are expensive retailers, there are cheap retailers. Buy the cheap ones and short the expensive ones. You know, mix it up with some pairs. Add some shorts into your portfolio. So that's going short. There's nothing, going short doesn't make you evil. You know, I don't know why everyone thinks that going short of something just makes you bad. It just means you think it's expensive. And there's a great script borrowing uh, market in our country. You can borrow script. You can go short most things here. Get involved in the mid and small cap. One of Simon's mates, Keith McLaughlin, great small cap analyst. You know, go read Keith's stuff. He puts out great research on small caps. Lots of unloved stocks down there. Anthony Clark, who used to be one of our analysts, Sometimes he gets it right, and sometimes, like last year, he got it wrong. But you know what? You've got to have a go. So add some small caps. Look at some of these small caps. And some of them are very cheap at the moment. And then add in some commodities. There's nothing wrong putting in some platinum, some silver, some copper, uh, some of these, some softs, corn, wheat, some of these things. into your... You know, if it was up to me on our model portfolio, we'd probably have 5 to 10% in commodities. But I always get voted down at our investment committee. Add some FX. There's nothing wrong with FX. And, and Standard Bank has some really nice exchange uh, FX notes, which are Rand Dollar and, and I think Rand Sterling, I think, are the, 
uh, might have Rand Euro as well, but they've definitely got Rand dollar exchange traded note. So if you think the currency was going to get punished at 1280s, you should have put it in your portfolio and you'd be smiling now at 1360 uh, Rand dollar. Look at volatility. Think about how you can price volatility via using something like the VIX. And then, so all of those are on our exchange. We have them on our exchange, on the JSC. These two, not so much on our exchange. Have a look at some of the esoteric stuff. Why not buy the cannabis ETF that's listed in Canada if you've got an offshore portfolio? You know, you might not like the substance, but the performance should be quite good. So, and, and that wasn't meant to be a pun. I just realized it came out very punished. But I mean, cannabis ETF out of Canada. There's a cryptos, a Bitcoin ETF that you can buy out of Sweden. You know, think about these things about how you can add them into your portfolio because there is alpha out there. And then if you get worried, if you've got a massive diversified portfolio and you're getting worried about it, instead of just cashing out and trying to sell everything, my message is hedge it out because we have a great derivatives market in this country. We have a futures and options market, which is very liquid. You can hedge out most of your risk with derivatives. Find your stockbroker and say, I'm getting worried. How can you do a derivative overlay of my portfolio and take out the risk? So those are my parting thoughts. So um, how did we do for time? We're okay. So um, happy to take some questions. Yo. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, so in 1991, I did my uh, thesis on option pricing theory. And I came up to the JSC and I hoped I'd get employed as a derivatives trader. And I only found there were two other guys trading options at the time. So there, was, there wasn't much job scope. So options are one of my things that I do like. And I, and I, I, I like what Simon's saying there. Most people hedge by buying at the money. Now, at the money is expensive sometimes. So if you have a view that the market's going to go down 40%, why pay for the first 2 or 3 or 5%? You know, and if you think the market's going to go down in six months from now, then pay for that extra bit of time because you're giving yourself a lot of time so you're not fighting against theta uh, on, that, on the decay on that option. So, yeah, if you want to make your option cheaper, buy it slightly at the money. So buy at the money puts. And we can talk about that afterwards. It's quite technical. But price up from options. Ask your guys to price your options 5 or 10% out of the money because sometimes they're cheap. And I can see lots of blank faces. So we're going to have to talk about that over a beer just now. Um, but you can either hedge doing one or two things. You can either do futures, which is a linear hedge, or you can do optionality, which is options. And both are available on the JSC. And I'm more than happy to chat with anybody afterwards about that. But thank you, Simon. That's one of those deep-end questions. What's your view on what's your view on listed properties, especially, especially looking at ETFs from a local and a global point of view? So I think there's two ways to play listed properties. There's the easy cheat way, which we do for smaller portfolios where you just go and buy a broad-based property ETF. So you either buy the entire property sector, so you can buy an ETF that's linked to the entire one, or you can buy the SAPI 10, which is just the top ones. I think you're doing yourself a disservice then because you probably want exposure to listed property companies that have East European, maybe UK exposure, et cetera. So the neppies of the world, these sort of, you know, now it's neppy rock castle. But if you're going to look in that property space, do your homework and probably pick not the big guys anymore because the yields on that are, are poor and they've also got a lot of stock. I mean, go drive around Santon and have a look how much extra stock there is. Have a look at the second tier, some of those property stocks, some of the smaller ones. And, Maybe what you want to do is, for your property component in your portfolio, buy one of the ETFs, cheap. It's cheap to go and buy all the property stocks via an ETF, and then add one or two sexy little property stocks to it. But not too sexy, because there are some right down the bottom that are giving you 15 16% yields. And the reason they're doing that is they're not particularly there. They're quite geared, they're quite risky, and probably avoid those ones. So... Not the top guys, not the bottom guys. Look somewhere in the between. And maybe look at the guys who've got, you know, European, East European, maybe some UK exposure. Did that answer it for you? I would do a mix of both. And in fact, that's what we do. We tend to buy the ETF and then we add two or three property stocks to that in our portfolio. Global property. So most of our clients are local. So they have local rents. So there, once again, you can cheat. You can go and buy uh, core shares of a fantastic global property portfolio ETF. So for our local clients, remember, they're going to already be using, let's say, 25% offshore component, and a portion of that's going to be properties. So for us, 
well, you're playing with only a couple of percent that's going to be international uh, property. So we would just go and buy one of those those sort of broad-based uh, property ETFs. We're actually slightly underweight property at the moment in our portfolio. If you had to look at a, what a market weighting would be, we're slightly underweight local property. You don't have, you say you have a model portfolio. You don't have the old school way of saying it must be 5% this and you dynamic it as time goes. So, I mean, there's two schools of thought on this. You just take the index and you say, I'm going to be over and underweight. Mm. And then you take that, or you take the all share, you break it down into its major sectors, then you go to subsectors, and then you go down into very stock specific. And then you decide whether you're going to be under or overweight. The problem with that model is you will be 22% NASPAS if you're equal weight. So, you kind of got to, You've got to take cognizance of that because you can't throw it away completely. But what we prefer to do is bottom-up build things. So you pick good stocks and then make sure once you put all of that together, you don't end up with only 100% industrials yeah, uh, or 100% value and no growth. So what you do is you moderate it coming down, but you pick stocks going up. Um, but I am a great believer, though, from a strategic asset allocation, you should go and say, yes, I want some commodity. I want some you – know, do you know what I mean? I want some property. I need to get to at least to have some property, but come from the bottom up. I don't find it. A question that came on the Twitters to me, uh, Tencent. Tencent? Yes. Yeah, well, what about it? <laughs> so we are currently Tencent. Is that, you know, the question was, is Tencent going to collapse? Is it going to, because if Tencent holds and if Tencent carries on running, frankly, I mean, that's 22% in yeah. the toppy. It's 35% in the indie. So I, I see no reason why it's going to turn around and head south. So, um, but what does worry me, it's, it's a massive component of our market yeah. and it's a massive component of the offshore market. Well, I think it's 10% or 12% of its own market as well. So that's two markets that it influences massively. And I don't – look, I'm a great believer in the FANG stocks. Anything that's got a tech feel to it at the moment seems to still be – still got some life in it. I don't know if you've seen the whole – when Amazon came into um, the sort of online retailing of, of um, fresh, fresh foods – um, what was that local stock? Um, not Whole local. Foods. Whole, Whole, Foods. Whole, Whole Foods got destroyed. Now, there's, it's not like they're going to be in that space immediately, but the market's already pricing in that Amazon will kill them in their own space. And that's the problem is the online retailers are slowly but surely killing the traditional retailers. We haven't seen that locally here yet, but I think we're going to see it. And while that trend is still going on, online gaming, online trading, fintech, uh, online retailing all seems to be okay for me at the moment. So I'm not scared yet. Yeah, the, the local retailers. I'm worried when it becomes 50% of our market, when Naspers is the entire market. The, the local retailers, I ordered something from Amazon and something from Take A Lot on the same day. And I mentioned this when we did a power hour last month. The order was on a Friday. The Amazon stuff arrived Monday. Take A Lot. It's coming by Dead Camel. It hasn't arrived yet. Ladies and gents, any more questions? We can do them in the bar. Cool. Afterwards. We'll park it there. Mark, really appreciate all no, the entertaining. Pleasure. Ladies and gents, I appreciate your time this evening. As I said, two more this year. Details will go out. Uh, if you have questions, give Mark a shout. Otherwise, head off to his website where your details are. Well, there it is. Out. Sorry, there was one last slide. <laughs> there was one last slide. Uh, Mark, appreciate Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening. Cheers, cool. all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, gents. Thank you.